Hello. Welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us for our program today, Asthma Emergencies for Public Health Staff. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and the email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handout, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online or if you're a public health employee through your CE coordinator, you'll need to register to access uh, those forms if you're outside of a, a public health viewing area. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program and then complete and return the sign-in sheet and the evaluation. While content of this program may remain relevant, CE credit for nurses will only be awarded for one year. They will expire on February the 28th, 2017, and two years for social workers expiring on February the 28th, 2018. I'm Valerie Cochran. I'm the Assistant State Nursing Director with the Alabama Department of Public Health. With me today is Dr. Karen Landers. She's Assistant State Health Officer and Medical Consultant for TB Control and the Immunization Division. Welcome, Dr. Landers. And um, if we're lucky, you may tell us a little bit about the TB outbreak as well. Yes. Well, thank you, Valerie, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this important topic today. I think it's extremely important that we as public health providers, whether we're nurses or physicians in our clinics, be able to recognize and respond to a situation where a patient is having an acute bronchospastic episode. Now again, we commonly refer to that as an asthma attack, but again, a bronchospastic episode in and of itself may not absolutely carry the diagnosis of asthma, but the purpose of our discussion today is to understand how we in our clinic situation can recognize such an episode and can intervene rapidly in a way to help the patient. Again, it's all about what we do taking care of patients. And I as a pediatrician have seen a real change in the way we understand and manage asthma through my years in practice. Well, one thing I want to talk about today is the really important aspect of what really is the pathophysiology of asthma? I think that has changed in terms of our understanding, which has led to differences in the way that we manage asthma on a long-term basis. And again, with some of the agents that we have now, it has changed the way we rapidly intervene. And let me just say here that as we talk about signs and symptoms of an acute asthma episode or an acute bronchospastic episode, we don't need to be fearful of intervening with this protocol or with this method because failure to intervene can have consequences for the patient, severe significant consequences. And the longer we wait to try to reverse the, the episode that the person is having or to intervene to at least buy us some time for managing that episode, the worse it is for the patient. So we don't need to be reluctant to intervene because again, we have equipment and supplies that are certainly recognized in literature as being appropriate for management, so we need to do that. In addition, I think the, you know, as we're doing this, it's always incumbent upon us to educate ourselves and learn more. I mean, when I was first in training many years ago, we, we didn't even have nebulizers, and I know that that sounds uh, amazing, but you have to remember, I, I was in medical school in the mid to late 70s, but nevertheless, we didn't have nebulizers, and holding chambers and meter dose inhalers were unheard of. So again, these are all uh, adjuncts to our medical care now and the ways that we can do better for patients. And Dr. Landers, can I uh, point out as well something I forgot to mention? We're going to show some, some equipment today, mm -hmm. and we're not endorsing that in any way. This is just the examples that we have, and uh, we wanted you to be able to see what is available to you, but we're in no way endorsing the product. Right. And again, there are many types of holding chambers, four meter dose inhalers. There are many different types of nebulizers and we're not endorsing a specific product. I have used several different products. The key is to be aware and be able to comfortably use a 
holding chamber for metered dose inhaler if you need to. And as you know, I mentioned in some of our clinics who have physicians available on site, we do use nebulizers. Again, the key is being able to comfortably use this. And, and I remind everyone that, you know, people are using these now, lay public, uh, you know, parents, I instruct my parents on how to use these uh, with their children. So this is something that is very accepted in, uh, in the uh, medical world. And again, we in public health, this is our protocol in the Alabama Department of Public Health in the way we respond to take care of our patients. So let's talk real quickly about, you know, why this is important. As I said, Patients can deteriorate very quickly. Just an example, we had a patient come in to the health department uh, about a year or so ago. It was during the time that we were uh, having uh, the enterovirus uh, 68, and uh, this child actually did not come in for pediatric services, but one of our nurses was able to rapidly assess that this child who was a known asthmatic, was having an acute bronchospastic episode. She was able to intervene very quickly. We got that patient to uh, the patient's physician. The child was subsequently hospitalized and did extremely well. And this would not have been uh, possible, I think, had this nurse not intervened. So used her nursing judgment, intervened, followed her protocol, and took very good care of the patient. Again, it also buys time for more definitive care. Again, we are not an emergency room. We're not an urgent care facility. We are a primary care clinic, if you will, or a primary care provider. But we need to be able to buy some time. Let's intervene quickly so we can get that patient to a more definitive care. And finally, this is something that through the years I have followed very closely in medical literature, and that is there are now standards of care for office and clinic emergencies uh, in multiple articles that state if you're in a an office that provides this type of care, you should be able to respond for certain emergencies. And again, bronchospasm just happens to be one of those emergencies that we should be able to respond. So again, what are the realities? Again, in our program, as with any program, uh, you know, there are times that we all forget our medication or we may not have something with us. Or we, I was supposed to bring a meter dose inhaler to demonstrate this this morning. Actually, the meter dose inhaler is sitting in my car. So again, I don't have it with me today. So again, uh, you know, we may not have those self-care measures with us, although I should have had it because Valerie told me to bring it. Uh, in addition, we know that the short-acting beta agonist, uh, the meter dose inhalers, um, albuterol, you know, for example, uh, they're readily available, they're easily administered, and they really have minimal side effects in the doses that we're going to give. You know, certainly some of us may have given our children albuterol and, you know, the child was you know, a little bit shaky or a little bit jittery, but again, you know, this is a very short uh, acting agent and it's also the side effects are, are, are limited. So again, intervening with a short acting beta agonist is going to be to the advantage of the patient. So, you know, let's be prepared to respond to that acute episode. Now let's talk a little bit about what is asthma. And asthma is a fascinating topic to me, probably second only to tuberculosis, as Valerie knows that's a, another interest of mine and one that I may uh, mention at the end of the, of the program today because I've been working on that with, with our staff. But again, asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease. We used to understand asthma more as a, a spasm of muscle, but now we recognize that asthma is really inflammatory. And this inflammation occurs in the lower airway leading to obstruction as well as increased reactivity, hyperreactivity of the airways. Now the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has done a wonderful job discussing asthma and not only providing the scientific information, but the practical tools as far as protocols and ways to manage children with asthma. So I refer to NHLBI quite a bit and they have, again, a, a wonderful protocol that is very, very useful uh, to those of us who, who treat uh, pediatric patients and adult patients. But it's also very, very thick, by the way, just, just to make you aware that there's a lot of material there and a lot of references. So what are the triggers? You know, what are the factors that can trigger asthma or bronchospasm? Well, we all know that allergens are important and certainly, you know, allergens uh, such as pet dander uh, can be an agent. We also know that persons who have uh, asthma, if they develop an upper respiratory infection, even a, a, a cold, uh, they can have 
a bronchospastic episode. Now, some people have what's called exercise-induced asthma. They may be perfectly fine when they're just walking around, but if they start exercising, if they're runners or if they're, you know, playing basketball or some sport, that may trigger bronchospasm. So as a, as a result of that, many of we pediatricians and family practitioners will advise measures for people to take prior to exercise to reduce the risk of developing a bronchospastic episode. And um, I had children who played sports, and I can tell you that on more than one occasion, uh, we had episodes during uh, our sporting events where uh, children might be having a bronchospastic episode. And of course, I tended to be the mother that walked around with a, a fresh inhaler and a chamber in, in my bag. Again, you know, many times we had this happen and you know, I tended to be the doctor in the stand with, with those kinds of things ready to respond. Uh, chemicals can be a factor, you know, the smell of chemicals or just a chemical agent such as, as a chlorine product that people might use uh, in their home for cleaning. This can trigger airway hyperreactivity and bronchospasm. Some patients have trouble uh, when the air is very cold or when the air is very dry. And, and there are some patients that when they are extremely upset, uh, something happens that can trigger their bronchospasm. As I mentioned earlier, weather changes. And also atopy, which is very, very important these days, avoiding pollens or minimizing exposure to pollens. You know, I tell my patients in the spring when the car has yellow dust on it, this is the way I like to explain it, when your car has yellow dust, don't think you have to open the windows like your mother used to do and get all that fresh air in. We need to keep those windows closed until the car no longer has yellow dust. It's very important. And so I think now as we're using, uh, you know, we're closing windows, we're using air conditioners, I mean, this does help keeping the pollens outside. For example, I tell parents, children who have atopia, yes, they're going to play outside, but when they come inside, they need to change their clothes and wash their hair because of the pollen that can be clinging to them. Now, in the, in the fall and winter, we have mold in the environment, and this can trigger. And one of the biggest concerns that uh, mothers uh, have discussed with me is the concern over dust mites. And, and you can really stress yourself trying to keep your house uh, free of dust mites. That's not going to happen, okay? You're not going to keep your house free of dust mites. So I give advice to my patients that when they have a child with asthma, Try to keep the child's room closed from the rest of the house. Vacuum or dust mop that room. I prefer not to have carpet in the room. Uh, use a mattress cover. Close that mattress in and tape that zipper. Again, just do the dust mite uh, reduction measures, but do it in the child's room. Otherwise, you try to do it all over the house. You'll be extremely stressed and you will spend a huge amount of money. And when we think about that most children spend eight or ten hours in that bedroom. That's where I try to make my allergy room. And I think you, you might sense from this that, that I've not only had professional experience with this, but I have a little personal experience with this uh, with, with my own children. And of course, animal dander. You know, many people would rather uh, give up a, an aunt or an uncle uh, than, than, a, than a, an animal. I mean, that, that's just the way it is. Uh, animals are very, very important. So I tell people, take advice of their physician or their allergist, there are measures to reduce animal dander if you're just not able to part with the animal in your home. You know, I tell parents I prefer not to have an animal in the home, and my children only had goldfish, but if this is important to your family, there are measures to take to reduce animal dander without having to remove the animal from the home. Again, this should be advice that you take from your physician or your allergist. And finally, I, I mentioned food and drugs here as triggering for asthma, but also triggering for bronchospasm and insect bites. And I, I mention all this because this is really kind of a subset agent or a subset situation that um, can trigger severe bronchospasm, such as an anaphylactic reaction. And this is something that we are more prepared in the schools than ever before, preparing children to, uh, first of all, avoid foods that might trigger bronchospasm, such as peanuts. Also, school nurses, and I really appreciate the school nurses and all that they do, having uh, instructions for the child. The child may have, at, depending on the school protocol, uh, the epinephrine for uh, reduction or uh, intervention in an anaphylactic 
episode. But again, these are all very, very important. And as we've talked about, certainly, you know, all drugs have some side effects, but for a short and limited and rapid intervention situation, these are not drugs that are, are dangerous to the patient, and this is something that can be life-altering and certainly life-saving. So let's talk about the pathophysiology for just a minute. Well, I mentioned inflammation, and inflammation is the hallmark of bronchospastic disease, of asthma. What happens is these agents that I mentioned earlier can cause an inflammatory reaction, and we won't go into all of the mast cell degranulation, although Valerie knows I like to talk about those things. We won't talk about that today, but it's sufficient to say that uh, an inflammatory reaction occurs uh, in, the, in the lower airway, which leads to swelling in that airway, edema in that airway, increased production of uh, mucus or secretions. Then we have smooth muscle contraction, and as a result of all that, those airways get smaller. And when those airways get smaller, the air cannot come in and out without the obstruction being heard in the form of a wheeze. So if you will, this all inflammation, edema, mucus production, plugging, contraction, all leads to bronchospasm, leads to wheezing. And again, we who deal a lot with asthma, uh, we ask, okay, is the child wheezing? But one caveat that I explain to my parents is when we know a child has a history of asthma, we don't want to wait till they're wheezing to do something, okay? So if your child is starting out, again, this is the advice that I give as a pediatrician and people want to take the advice of their doctor and their management. But if I have a child that has a known history of bronchospasm or a child that tends to, when they're running and playing, they're cough, 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 you know, and then they sit down and rest and that cough goes away, I remind parents that, you know, they very well could be having asthma or bronchospasm, but they just haven't gotten to the wheeze phase yet. So now we know as physicians that we want to intervene early in managing our patients in our medical setting prior to their actually having bronchospasm to occur. And again, I'm speaking uh, just as background here because what I want to get to today is our talking about managing a patient in the clinic. But I think it's important to understand the background and parents become very good at determining when their child is starting to have issues. And now we have uh, really have uh, the uh, instruments such as the handheld peak flow meters where we can assess how much airflow that child actually has and you know have children hopefully to have the peak flow meter, have their asthma plan, and know what to do. But the reality is sometimes that doesn't happen. And when it doesn't happen, we need to be able to intervene. Again, I mentioned early warning signs. We want to intervene before we start coughing our heads off. I mean, that's just really, really important. So if we have a child that has this history, uh, increased cough, uh, difficult sleeping, fatigue, breathlessness, these may all precede that wheezing episode that we, that we have. And again, common signs. Well, as I mentioned, those earlier uh, elements that then lead to bronchospasm, wheezing, increased work of breathing. A child that can breathe in, but you know, when they breathe out, it's a, it's a prolonged expiration. They're having to force decreased breath sounds. These are all signs that we really don't want to see because we want to have intervened before that. But decreased ability to cry or talk. And I go back to the patient that uh, my nurse had, uh, and my nurse is actually, there were multiple nurses involved in this patient that came into our WIC clinic. And, and this was a child that uh, was exhibiting symptoms of you know, decreased ability to talk, decreased ability to cry. This child was very agitated. Again, you know, these were signs with this known child uh, with, with asthma, with wheezing, et cetera. Uh, but these were uh, the elements that the nurses, before they ever put a stethoscope on the child, were able to very rapidly assess and determine that there was a problem. Well, again, there is a at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, <coughs> of, excuse me, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I'm make sure I say that correctly, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, I like to call it CHOP because Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is a mouthful. They have a, a wonderful uh, protocol, and you can actually look this up online. And 
really gives an idea of a mild, moderate, severe, gives a breakdown of mild, moderate, severe. And, and this is how I like to categorize asthma when I am dealing with patients. And it really helps us in terms of knowing what intervention. Now, again, the mild, moderate, severe takes us from you know, just using meter dose inhaler with albuterol all the way to uh, the more significant interventions such as uh, continuous albuterol and steroids and, and all the other agents that we won't talk about today. But again, if we're having a mild episode, uh, certainly the child may, may only have uh, some wheezing, uh, may only be able to discern that wheezing uh, when you're really, really pressing down with that stethoscope and listening for several breaths. Uh, may have little to no uh, work of breathing uh, increase and may not have a problem with prolonged inspiration. And this child uh, might just be, you know, acting pretty normal, running around the house or sitting there, you know, coughing a little bit. Uh, the pulse oximetry, the saturation is greater than 94%. And of course, uh, uh, children with asthma should have a peak flow meter and their peak flow is greater than 70%. And these are all elements that parents need to be looking at at home. They may not have a pulse oximeter, but certainly you know, should have a peak flow meter. If we have a child that has a moderate episode, this is much more wheezing, uh, intercostal, retraction, prolonged expiration, may not be able to talk uh, in phrases. They may be a little agitated. You know, I as a pediatrician, the, I have a history of a child that's, uh, that is wheezing and you know, I always tell my medical students so that I don't listen to fabric when there's a child that uh, I comes into my office, they're always going to get that shirt pulled up. We're always going to listen you know, on the skin. We're not going to listen to fabric. We don't escult over fabric. Now maybe that's done in commercials, but it's not done in, in the medical world. That, that should not be done. Again, I pull that shirt up and take a quick look at the chest. You know, if this child has intercostal retraction, then, you know, I know there's a problem before I ever touch that child with my stethoscope. And at that point, you know, if I've got someone that's coughing and they're agitated and they've got intercostal retraction, you know, I don't need to wait and listen with my stethoscope to determine I need to do something. Same way with, you know, the, the nurses that I work with. They know they've got to go get the emergency card uh, while other nurses are assessing. They need to just go ahead and mobilize their emergency card and be ready to take care of that patient. Now the saturation can be variable in a moderate episode. The SAT can be 94% or above, or it can be lower. Again, you know, we don't, we don't like SATs less than 94 in pediatrics. We, we just don't like that at all. Uh, you know, our kids aren't COPDs for the most part unless they have some other underlying problems. We, we don't like that SAT being less than 94. So as a result of that, you know, we want to go ahead and intervene. But again, the SAT can be variable here, so don't let the SAT fool you. If you've got a child that has these signs and symptoms, but, oh, they're satting at 95, you know, well, we still need to intervene with the, the uh, immediate uh, management because, you know, we can help that child, and we're not, we're not going to just base it on that SAT. And again, uh, for parents that are, you know, hopefully they have their asthma action plan, certainly in their older children, and peak flow meters. Hopefully they won't be showing up to us with this episode. They'll be going to their physician, but we recognize it can happen. So if it can happen, we need to be prepared for it. And finally, severe. And again, this is the episode that uh, I don't, I, it doesn't really matter how many times I ever see this happen. And thankfully, I don't see it happen very often now, but I always go back to when I was first in training and seeing children with really severe episodes. And we just didn't have as many uh, mechanisms to intervene then as we do now. I mean, we, we had to use uh, uh, in, infused agents. Uh, we, it was in the very early era of using steroids. So I'm so grateful that we have better management of the chronicity of asthma so that we can do more for patients than ever before and we can reduce morbidity and certainly mortality as a result of asthma. But if we're having a severe episode, again, I urge you to look at the CHOP protocol on this. It's a nice one-pager and it is very, very educational. Uh, we see inspiratory and expiratory wheeze, but we may also see a silent chest. And again, this is not something that I want to see uh, in a child because this is an extremely severe episode. But these children are pulling, they're retracting, I mean, they're gasping. This is really bad. And just as in a baby that may be having an episode of bronchiolitis, you can see a seesaw where basically 
the abdomen is going in and out. The chest is going in, the abdomen is going out. It's like a seesaw. Severe prolonged expiration. We don't want to see that happening, but it could happen in our clinics and we need to be prepared to respond. Certainly we want to activate our emergency protocol, call 911 and go ahead and get that child transported out. But in the meantime, we can do some intervention, even with a, a young infant. Now, as I said, pulse oximetry is variable, and again, we don't want to base everything we do on a single oxygen sat. You know, there are episodes that even a child with severe wheezing, we can, you know, appear to have better sat than we really do. So let's don't let just one thing uh, make us think, oh, this, this child's okay, they really don't need anything. If they are having respiratory distress, then we need to intervene. So. Dr. Lenners, I'm assuming that a, a, a child or even an adult with this severe um, asthma attack is probably going to be cyanotic. You know, Val, you... that is a very good question. In adults, adults like to read the textbooks more than children do. Children like to do variable things, so we pediatricians can can be a little, uh, you know, have to, have to think a little more about it. Uh, certainly, adults can be cyanotic or kind of dusky. Children can fool you, and that's why. Yes, you know, they, they can be still somewhat pink, so we don't want to be fooled by that. So if they're having these physical findings, and that's an excellent question for you to bring up, then we need to go ahead and intervene. Again, even if that sat is looking, you know, like it's 95 or so, let's still go ahead and intervene based upon those physical findings. And, you know, interestingly that you mentioned this, uh, you know, Val knows that I have a million stories. Um, I had a, a situation to occur one time. I was at a a medical meeting uh, actually uh, as, as a really uh, with another person so it was not that I was actually attending the medical meeting and both my children were with me uh, and of course they were probably in the you know six to ten uh, years of, of age and uh, mother is known for carrying nebulizers in her car so that's just one of those things and there was a person at the meet at not at the meeting a person at the hotel who was a known adult asthmatic who was really wheezing, gasping, and having a lot of problems. And uh, as a res uh, and we were at a place that was not very close. It was one of these uh, almost resort type uh, uh, medical meeting uh, event venues here in Alabama. Uh, and this lady was really just coughing, wheezing, and having a lot of trouble. And we just happened to be right there waiting in the lobby and notice all this. And I. I asked this lady if she had a problem. Well, yes, she did, but she had forgotten her inhaler. Well, fortunately, we were at a meeting of a group of internists, which helped me because I'm a pediatrician. But, you know, uh, I went out to my car with my children. We got the nebulizer. We brought it back in. And, of course, in the meantime, I had asked someone to please go get one of these internists because this is an adult. And while... Yes, I, I can treat adults. I'm, I'm a little more comfortable if, they, if they're younger. So we were actually able to give this lady a nebulizer treatment and get her to definitive medical care because, you know, we were not in a situation where she would have done well had she not been able to get some nebulized albuterol or, you know, if an agent like this, a meter dose inhaler, which she did not have with her. And, uh, you know, at the time I happened to have both, but uh, the nebulizer seemed to be more appropriate and there was a pulmonologist there and so again I just brought in the nebulizer and turned it over to the pulmonologist and I was asked afterwards why do you have this in the car and I said well you can't ever tell we might need one so again uh, my famous mantra is if I don't have one you don't need one so well, we can go out to my car and get a meter dose inhaler in a little bit um, so again getting back to supplies well again in our health departments we're not an acute care facility but this kind of episode as I mentioned, the lady with bronchospasm, we actually had this happen in one of our local health departments a few years ago with an adult who came in for a flu shot and was waiting in the waiting room and actually had a situation where our nurses had to intervene. So again, it's good to have the equipment that you need. No, I don't carry an oxygen cylinder. I know everybody will be disappointed that I don't carry one of those. I probably would like to, but that, that's a little bit out of my range here. Um, but again, an oxygen delivery system in case we have a SAT less than 94 and we need to go ahead and, and give the person some oxygen again by our protocol. An albuterol meter dose inhaler with a chamber, and again we have chambers here, various types of chambers. Uh, I can't endorse one over the other other than to say that I do feel like in a child under 8 years of age that 
we need to have a face mask just because these children are not able to breathe in and time the respiration so I like a face mask I think most pediatricians do and even some adult pulmonologists and allergists like the face mask for adults but again it's really up to that physician personal preference and also the the comfort of the of the patient uh, a pulse oximeter is is very very useful and, and these are, are nominally cost now so they're good to have uh, I actually do have one in my car uh, and if if uh, available uh, it's nice to have a nebulizer but if we don't we can the meter dose inhalers are reasonable again for intervention and are accepted are very accepted and again an emergency treatment record we certainly need to have a record as we do in our protocol make sure that the patient can uh, the care can be documented so let's talk about procedures for just a minute and then we'll do some demonstration and again this is for the Alabama Department of Public Health but this is um, similar material to a lot of office protocols that that physicians uh, might have in, in their particular setting again depending on the type of, of uh, work that they do in that office but again it's always appropriate in by our protocol to activate your emergency plan and call 911 uh, again we're not a mer acute mm -hmm. care facility so we need to be able to call and and get emergency assistance there as expediently as possible uh, let's allow patients to assume the position of comfort and again for children I like to talk about children and for children the position of comfort very often is sitting with their parents and sometimes kids like to lean forward and that's you know if that's how the patient likes to be uh, don't take a child out of the parents arms and sit them on an exam table that's just not done unless that's what the child wants to do okay we assist the patient it's good if a patient has a history of asthma and they happen to have their meter dose inhaler with them that's really helpful they have the agent that they might use that their doctor has prescribed for them that is their regular rescue medication and that's really the way we refer to this as rescue medication assist the patient with their rescue medication if they need it you know if they're like me they'll have it in their bag but their bag will have everything else in the world and the meter dose inhaler will be in the very bottom you know always in the very very bottom down in the crease or a fold under you know something like a checkbook or a wallet or you know a, a can of Diet Coke so again you know it'll, it'll if they have it available that's good and we want to use the product that their physician has prescribed for them however if they do not have their rescue medication then we use the albuterol clinic protocol dose by age and weight and again that is in your protocol so use the dosage by age and weight that is in our Alabama Department of Public Health accepted protocol I want to talk about basic inhaler technique here infants and young children and I'll go ahead and, and pick up uh, the uh, chamber here and just say that this is this is one of the chambers that we use and we'll talk about this a little more uh, in a moment but this is really really uh, acceptable and again a lot of it depends on the face size of the child but this can be useful up to a couple of years of age again if you have a child that has uh, kind of a small facial structure it can be useful but sometimes I have to go to a larger chamber in uh, toddlers depending again on the facial structure and the size of the face it, some adults I have have a very very small nose and mouth I can actually use a, a child chamber again it's almost like uh, what size works for that particular age but again using a chamber with a face mask under eight years of age or older if that is what works for you and that's what the child prefers I mean it's not going to be if you have a nine or ten year old and they're not able to time the breathing it is perfectly fine to use a chamber that fits onto their face if that is is appropriate for them can I interrupt you yes, for a second I'm sorry um, <clears throat> talking speaking of a chamber will you tell us the importance of this chamber because you know on TV sometimes you see them just doing it right in their mouth and breathing it in and, and going on and um, tell us why this is important even for an adult okay and that is a very good question Valerie and again I am a pediatrician I, I'm not an allergist or pulmonologist and I do recognize that allergists and pulmonologists might have a slightly different approach with their individual patient or what works in their practice but in my understanding and in my training about this the issue related to putting the meter dose inhaler, inhaler right up to the mouth uh, about an inch or so away spraying it and opening the mouth is that 
if the inspiration, I'm, I'm, I teach a lot of inhaler techniques, so before I realize that I'll be taking a deep breath and holding it for 10 seconds here. But the technique, unless you are very good at the spray and immediately inhaling and holding your breath for 10 seconds before you exhale, then a certain amount of that albuterol winds up on the back of the throat, okay? And we want to get it into the lower airway. And that's why with a chamber, you have your albuterol that is sprayed into the chamber. So you have the opportunity on inspiration and expiration. And again, I apologize, but I, I, I teach a lot of, of inhaler techniques, so I, I get a little carried away here. But again, with inspiration and expiration, you're able to inhale that albuterol and get that albuterol where it needs to be down in the airways, lower airways, instead of on the back of the throat. So that's the importance of a chamber. And that's why even in in most adults, I, I, I personally like the chamber, uh, but I do recognize that uh, other physicians may have different techniques and based upon the understanding of the way their patient takes medication. In, in my particular practice of patients and what I believe works for, you know, for my nursing staff, in infants and young children, you want to use a face mask chamber, again, because you want to get the albuterol where it needs to go. So again, in using the chamber with children, and this is something that uh, a number of years ago there was not as much literature as there is now uh, using a meter dose inhaler as opposed to using a nebulizer. So, but what we have found from much uh, research and literature is that you, if you use a meter dose inhaler with a chamber and with each puff or spray of the albuterol, you keep the, the spacer over the face, allow the child to take four breaths. Now, you know, sometimes you'll have a young child and they're doing just like this as you're, as you're trying to administer this. So I, I ask the parents to assist me and, and we, we work with the child in keeping this over the face. And again, if this is an acute episode, a child is having trouble breathing, we're getting, we're getting 911 there pretty quickly too. But this is what we have in the meantime. So when we're, using, when we're giving a puff of medication, and I'll talk about this again at the, end of the, at the end of the discussion as a demonstration, we'll have the chamber over the face, we'll spray, and allow the child to breathe four breaths, and then I take the chamber off the face, mm -hmm. and I wait a minute or so, and then I will give the second activation, depending on the number of puffs that we need to provide. So for older children and adults, spacer chamber, it's if, if I have a child usually around seven or eight, and, and some kids, some kids even younger, but usually around seven or eight, I can teach them how to use the chamber, spray the meter dose inhaler, take a deep breath, hold for 10 seconds, exhale back into the chamber. Now I like for people to do that twice, take a deep breath, hold for 10 seconds, exhale back into the chamber, and then take another deep breath, hold for 10 se seconds, exhale back into the chamber. Then take the chamber away, wait a minute or two, and then repeat the puff. I usually wait about a minute, but you know, a minute or two, and I tell people it doesn't have to be 59 seconds or 61 seconds, you know, just about a minute, and again, time it fairly closely, but you know, about a minute is fine. Can I ask okay. you another question? Yes. Um, so when you you actuate the the meter dust inhaler, and then you do the the two, and then but then when you put it back on, it's another actuation. That's correct. Uh, you don't just let them breathe what's in there. You actually give them another squirt of the MDI. Right. Okay. That's cor that's correct. And we'll actually do a little bit of demonstration here at the end. But I think the most important thing to remember is with each actuation, you're going to actuate with the chamber in place. You're going to actuate with the chamber in place. And if you actuate that, the person is going to take the number of breaths that they need to take. At that point in time, we will then remove the chamber, wait a minute, and give the next number of puffs. Again, based upon our protocol. And I'm not specifically going through doses in the protocol today because it is in the protocol. And I want you all to look at and read the protocol on the number of dose, on the number of actuations that we need. Again, this is our protocol for the Alabama Department of Public Health. Uh, this protocol is actually the doses 
uh, and the information that uh, I developed this uh, is from the uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia from uh, some uh, lectures that I had attended with the American Academy of Pediatrics at some of their national meetings, the Harriet Lane Handbook. There are multiple resources on the management and the doses of asthma uh, medication for acute bronchospasm. I'm going to speak just for a second about basic oxygen administration just to be aware of this again as part of the protocol. Now we want to follow the protocol for storage and maintenance. We, we can't just leave the oxygen cylinder in a uh, an, an unprotected area or an area that there might be sparking and of course mm -hmm. uh, Valerie has information when we store that correctly you know no one should be smoking around this of course no one should be smoking in the building anyway but we just it's a good thing to always remind everyone smoke you know of all kinds not just smoking but maybe a risk of fire something of that nature we want to store correctly so follow your protocol for storing your cylinder maintaining your cylinder making sure your cylinder has oxygen in it and make sure there's not a, a problem or an issue related to this and while that seems fairly straightforward I mean, you know when my mother was with me uh, prior to her passing and we had oxygen cylinders that we had to use for emergency purposes you know it's a little bit of a trick to know how to uh, to have that that regulator on there etc so it's very very important that we uh, are trained on that we make sure we know how to use that and I had to change out a cylinder one night at uh, about midnight and I had only a flashlight and I really uh, developed great appreciation for respiratory therapists and EMTs at that point because I'm sure they do it a lot better than I do uh, but again oxygen technique use uh, in really blow by is perfectly fine in uh, infants and young children and even adults and and I use the blow by what I call the blow by is basically you're, you're holding the tubing uh, or the mask up to the face about an inch or so away from the face. Uh, a lot of kids when they're having trouble and even adults they won't tolerate having that mask right clamped on the face. So again if you're holding it close by you know that's that's a reasonable thing to do in the interim until uh, emergency medical services can get there. If this person needs oxygen blow by or Holding the mask up to the face as close as possible that the person will tolerate is fine until emergency services can get there. And again, you're blowing the oxygen by, if you will. And we're trying to maintain a SAT of greater than 94%, but certainly if you're satting at 100, then you need to dial that puppy down uh, and take that oxygen away and uh, just make sure they're satting at, at 94 or above. So again, you don't need to be satting them at 100%. Again, our patients, as, as I've talked about in Perry County, in public health as well as in, in any clinical and medical setting, our patients are our priority. And we in the Alabama Department of Public Health have the commitment to provide the most up-to-date and the most appropriate medical care for our patients, regardless of the reason that they have come in. Uh, if we're trained, and we follow our protocols, then our patients will benefit from this. We can respond confidently, we can respond correctly, and we can make a huge difference in the outcome of the patients. And again, for what we are doing here, all of these interventions are, are safe interventions. These are all interventions that registered nurses uh, can confidently do in order to improve the outcome of our patients. And again, as I like to give stories, uh, I had a phone call back from uh, the physician that, that was involved in the management of the child that we sent, uh, or that we actually got over to their office uh, from about a year or so ago. And the physician was heaping compliments upon our nurses and asking if they might want to come to work at their office. And I said, no, uh, they're public health nurses. They have to stay with me. But again, uh, very, very impressed with, with what our people did because they took rapid intervention. Again, this should be a standard of care. But we do recognize that we have to stay up to date. We have to follow these standards. We have to do these things uh, regardless of the setting that we're in in order to be able to improve the outcome of our patients. I've put in a couple of references here. Uh, those of you that heard me speak before that you know that I've I got a million references on everything because I think it's so important. You know, my, my daughter's a physician and she 
was mentioning to me not too long ago that she practiced evidence-based medicine. And I thought that was really good because that's what I've been doing my whole career. Uh, I just don't think we use that term until more recently. But again, this is evidence. This is all excellent information uh, in uh, asthma management and bronchospasm management. Every one of these references uh, can provide a significant additional information. And I also want to mention the American Academy of Allergy uh, and uh, immunology, they have not only the scientific information, but they also have uh, a lot of training information on that website. Specifically, they have very good uh, programs that nurses can do, uh, of CM CEU type programs uh, that are, are web-based. Uh, they're very short. They're, they have programs on anaphylaxis. They have programs on asthma. So again, a lot of good educational material that uh, I think can enhance our ability to respond to our patients. So Valerie, that's all I have except for the practical aspects of this. Well, that's great. Um, and I would remind everybody to send us an email or give us a call. That would be great. I, I do have a couple of questions that, okay. that came to Good. mind as you were talking. Okay. Which you covered why the chamber is important. Can you expound on the importance of flu vaccine for people with asthma? Absolutely, Valerie, and you know that's another one of my favorite subjects is immunization. I, I think a lot of people know that I'm the medical consultant for tuberculosis control and immunization. And studies have shown over and over that people who have pulmonary problems or asthma can benefit significantly from taking the flu vaccine. I mean, we know the flu vaccine is not 100% effective. I mean, in a good year, we may have 60 to 70%, but that's still better than no percent at all. And again, children especially, again, that's my passion because I am a pediatrician, but children who have already an underlying issue or an underlying problem, if they contract influenza on top of this, not only can they have an extremely severe uh, episode with their asthma and deterioration, but they can also develop, for example, from influenza, they can get a secondary bacterial pneumonia, which can severely complicate uh, the management of anyone who has an underlying pulmonary problem. So absolutely, and even before we went to universal influenza vaccine, which is a goal of mine for everyone to take influenza vaccine, uh, that certainly can take it. But if we prioritize at the very first minute the flu vaccine is out, let's go ahead and get our kids and our adults that have severe underlying health problems, let's get them vaccinated. And that's what, you know, I, I try to do is make sure that any patients that I have that have influenza, uh, excuse me, that have asthma uh, are vaccinated. And also I'm a bug about that with my TB patients. You know, make sure we get people vaccinated because having protection from influenza is very, very important to prevent the secondary complications that can occur. We, we do have a question from an email question which, um, also goes along with a question that I have. Okay. The question from the email is, um, are there any advancements in medication to prevent or relieve an emergency situation for asthma? But in that same vein, you know, we see those TV commercials for certain agents that say may increase the re risk of death from an asthma attack. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, and again, uh, just to remind everyone that I am not an allergist or a pulmonologist. I'm speaking as a general pediatrician and based upon my experience uh, in that field. You know, I think something that we have to remember when we're talking about short-acting beta agonists versus long-acting beta agonists, and again, I'll defer to my pulmonary colleagues on the long-acting beta agonists, but when we're looking at commercials on television that, that talk about really some of the preventive type agents that are out there. As a pediatrician myself, what I try to do with patients that, that have asthma is I, I want to have a preventive plan. I want to have a plan that reduces the episodes of bronchospasm. And there are agents out now that are uh, useful agents to reduce asthma episodes, one being a lot of people are using more inhaled steroids, and that's, that's very safe and very effective. Uh, in addition, there are uh, agents that are uh, a pill type agent, and that I don't want don't, to mention a, a, a brand name, but you know it is an agent that not only works for 
allergies, but also works for asthma. And this is something that, you know, I have many of my patients uh, using this agent. But again, uh, these are to try to decrease inflammation. The goal is anti-inflammatory medication, reducing that airway inflammation. If we can reduce that inflammation and we can minimize triggers, and that's really the goal, reduce inflammation and minimize triggers, and they kind of go hand in hand there, then we don't have these acute bronchospastic episodes with all of this uh, mucus plugging and inflammation down in the airways and damage to the airways and remodeling the airways. I mean, we don't want to see that happen, okay? We don't want to see a child that has asthma grow up to have uh, pulmonary problems because they didn't get appropriate treatment in, in childhood, as, as we don't want adults to continue to have this. So the goal is prevention. And if I'm, if I'm correct on uh, interpreting the question here, what these agents are that are being advertised on television are a, a longer acting agent. So basically they're not a rescue medication. They're in the same family of drugs for the most part as, as the albuterol, but they are a longer acting agent and some of them are combined with a steroid. And again, I'm not a pulmonologist or an allergist, but you know, that is, that's my basic description of that and the way I'd explain it to my patient is you have what, this is your rescue medicine. This is your quick acting medicine. And then I'm gonna put you on a longer acting medicine. Now the reason they state this, I believe in these, in these commercials, and again, this is my, my personal understanding, is that what, they, what we want our patients to understand when they have a history of asthma is you should always be prepared. I mean, I tell my parents of kids with asthma, I want mother to have an inhaler, I want dad to have an inhaler, I want grandmother to have one, you know, because people forget things or they, they leave it in their car, you know, something like that. So at a sporting event, you know, if, if the child left his or her inhaler uh, in the gym bag, then that's okay because mother's up there in the stands and she's got that inhaler ready to go. But these are our short acting, these are our rescue, these are our quick agents. We may have our patient on one of the longer acting agents. And the reason these commercials say this is they want people to understand that if you are uh, just using your long acting agent and you start having uh, acute episodes and maybe you just start using your rescue agent and you don't call your doctor or your nurse practitioner and talk to them about, you know, my asthma is getting worse or my bronchospasm is getting worse or I've had to use my rescue medication six times this week, then that can lead to death because they can continue to have severe bronchospastic episodes and at some point these medications just aren't working, okay? And they're just not relieving uh, the bronchospasm because guess what's really happening? It's inflammation, okay? So this is just to rescue. And kind of an aside from this, what I tell my patients, because we categorize asthma as actually, you know, uh, mild, intermittent, mild, persistent, moderate, and severe. There, are, And again, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. What I tell my patients that may just occasionally have a bronchospastic episode, I tell them if, if you're dating that inhaler, this is my personal recommendation, more than a couple of times a week, then you need to give me a call, okay? Because many pulmonologists and allergists will gauge which anti-inflammatory medication they use, whether it's the chewable pill agent or whether it's the um, uh, inhaled steroid agent or whether a child might need a short burst of oral steroids and that, that is done in asthma. But they will judge that based upon how often the child is using a rescue agent. So rescue agents are not for something that you use three or four times a day and if I don't have it, I'm wheezing. That is not the way, you know, we want to manage asthma. So I think that was the, my understanding of those commercials, and I have seen them, uh, and, and I'm always thinking, yes, it's good that you see this on television, but please talk to your doctor or your nurse practitioner because that's your best source of medical information. Uh, thanks, I appreciate that. Ooh, well, looks like we've got some more questions okay. here, so that's good. Uh, do you typically see asthma 
present at an early age, or is it fairly common for adults to develop asthma symptoms at an older age? Well, again, you know, I'm a pediatrician, and I think that uh, we've, we've kind of broadened our range in terms of, and, and I'm sorry, but I think my cell phone is ringing and it's not on, vi <laughs> on vibrate. I, I mean, it's on vibrate, so I apologize for that, but we'll just let it ring. Uh, the, maybe I should cut it off. I'm trying to cut it off uh, in a minute. But uh, as I was going to say, when we talk about children, and again, that's, that's where, where my primary training is, we have to remember that we want to intervene with bronchospasm early. Now, it, you know, it could be a child that has a viral illness and bronchiolitis. I mean, one episode of wheezing doesn't define asthma. We have to leave that to, you know, what the clinical history is, what the history is over a course of time, what the family history is, what the triggers, and again, consultation with our, with our pulmonologist and or our allergist. But getting back to, do I see this uh, more in children or can adults develop this? Adults can develop asthma at any age, okay? And all children who wheeze in childhood don't necessarily go on to have asthma as adults. One understanding that I do have looking at literature is that we used to say that children outgrow asthma. We, we don't say that anymore. Uh, what happens, rather, is that as the children grow and they have obviously increased uh, lung capacity, increased uh, airway capacity, they are less reactive or less responsive to some of these triggers. And I have treated children that had problems, you know, for a few years in childhood, but with a good management plan, by the time they got to be teenagers or adults, they weren't having any trouble anymore. But I do remind people that if you had a lot of wheezing and needed to see an allergist or pulmonologist in childhood, even if you get 10 or 12 years of age and bam, you don't have any more trouble, be aware of that history because you can have trouble as an adult. So again, childhood asthma doesn't necessarily lead to adult asthma, but adults, children need to be aware they can carry that into adulthood as well as adults can develop asthma at any age. So. You know, you're talking about when you went to medical school. I was in nursing school at the same time you were okay. in medical school. And um, one of the girls that was in school with me said that they did not want to let her in school because she had asthma because they said it was a psychosomatic illness and that she was just reacting to stimuli and that, you know, she basically had a mental issue. And, and I, I just found that interesting right. as in a nursing profession that you would think that about asthma at, at that time. Um, we, we talked about these inhaler, I mean, the, excuse me, the chambers. Mm -hmm. So we can send this home with the patient and they can reuse them, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, it's single use for the patient, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, I mean, excuse me, it's single use for us, but once the patient uses it, it belongs to them. Uh, Valerie, are we, are we ready to just do a little brief demonstration sure, of ahead. this? And yeah. again, I, I apologize for the cell phone. I thought I had it on silent, but apparently I didn't. And if we have a moment, we'll talk about TB because I'm sure that's what it was about. Oh, we have three chambers here, and basically this is what I would consider my infant and young child uh, chamber. And as we mentioned how we want to use this, the first thing we want to do is if we're going to actuate our meter dose inhaler, we want to obviously take it out of the box, we want to shake it. Always shake that meter dose inhaler. Take that cap off the end. Many times the, in the, the uh, more recent ones that I've seen, um, even in the generics, the cap is attached by a little flange, and that's fine. You just flip the cap down, uh, and you can put the meter dose inhaler uh, end into the chamber. Okay, so you either take your cap off or you flip the flange down, put it on the inhaler. You've already shaken your inhaler. Uh, you've already shaken your meter dose inhaler first. Then once you're ready and you're set up to give the child the prescribed number of puffs, you want to fit the mask onto the face, and as I said, this is a this is a, a infant young child mask. You want to get a good seal. Uh, this is actually uh, a very nice material. This is a silicone type material. It's very nice, fits very nicely uh, to the face. But you don't have to jam it on the face like that, you know. This, and that's one thing I tell people: do this as a comfort measure. As I mean, we don't need to smush it on the face. We need to uh, just put it on the face where it's comfortable, where the uh, the uh, nose piece is actually at the bridge of the nose, and you'll see that the mouthpiece will kind of be in the cleft, you know, right in the cleft of the chin. So we put that on, 
we're ready. We're going to spray. And again, you know, we're doing this more quickly than what I'm, I'm doing here. We're going to put this on. We're going to spray the pup. The child will take four breaths in. And again, the child will probably be doing some of this stuff, but, but we'll get it done. It's close enough. They take four breaths for that, that puff. Then we want to remove that chamber and wait a minute and then go back and give the other prescribed doses. In other words, you don't want to go spray, 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 spray if you've got four doses and just hold it on the child's face. Now, this is how I do it. There are people who do this slightly differently. This is, this is the way that I do it. But I do a spray. I let that child breathe the four natural breaths, and I, I remove it, and then I wait a minute or so, and then I do my additional pups. Again, this is how, how I do this as a pediatrician. This is our protocol for the Alabama Department of Public Health. Should we be doing the blow by oxygen between that? If needed. If our okay. SAT is, is less than 94, then we would just hold our oxygen up on our blow by technique. And again, that depends on the SAT. The okay. SAT's very important, so we want to be aware of that. May, the SAT may be fine, but the child's wheezing. And, and, you know, again, clinical judgment, but if the SAT, you know, we're going to have to go by the SAT meter because that's what we have. Um, this is, again, for the older child, and uh, it's, as you can see, slightly larger face piece. Uh, I have used this in adults. In fact, uh, I won't do it here, but I actually can use this chamber because it fits my face. Uh, but this is the same thing, the nose piece. You want to put this, um, you know, the bridge of the nose, and this will be in the cleft of the chin. And, again, we don't push it on the face like that. We just gently put it onto the face. And, and you'll have a reasonably good seal because this does... Uh, this material is very soft. Same thing as I mentioned earlier, shake that meter dose inhaler, make sure that cap is off, put the cap into the end of your chamber, chamber on the face, spray. And then again, for the child that I have had younger kids that can take a deep breath and hold it, but you know, if they can't, we do the four natural breaths and then we remove this from the face and do the following. Uh, doses at, at minute intervals again and you'll follow your protocol based upon the number of doses that we have there. So these are the two chambers that we use for infants and young children. As I said, some adults can use this depending on the size of the face. And people say, well, how do you know if an adult can use if, if it comfortably fits the bridge of the nose and the cleft of the chin, then, you know, it, it fits. Okay, but again, uh, you know, like women especially, smaller facial structure can, can use this and I can use this myself. Okay, uh, this is actually a chamber that is, is a reasonable chamber to use. And again, these are all single use for, the, for us. The patient can take them home, but they're no longer, once we've used them, they're no longer in our cart. We have to replace them. And this is actually, a, to me, a nice adult chamber. And one advantage in, uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I was the mother carrying things like this around. Uh, but as, a, as an adult, this, you know, the advantage of this is it's small and it, it can, it's collapsible. So you just pop that up and, you know, this has a nice little, this is so nice it even has the, uh, you know, fingerprints on either side of it. And this is the end where your a meter dose inhaler, again, flip that cap down or take that cap off, shake, 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 make sure you've got shaken up and you can fit the meter dose inhaler into this portion of the chamber. And then, of course, this is the portion where you can see where the mouthpiece is, is actually on the end. It's very neat. It's very self-explanatory. And these are actually very good for patients to have, especially adults that might not, uh, you know, prefer to use a chamber or maybe their physician has advised them to do this. Again, we're talking about, you know, sort of my preferences as a physician, and this is how I do things. So, again, we have this opportunity to use uh, this chamber, then we put the chamber in the mouth, we take our breath. Now, in these particular chambers, we can breathe in. We can hold the breath for 10 seconds. I tell people, breathe in, hold for 10 seconds. You know, we obviously sprayed first, hold for 10 seconds, and then breathe out into the chamber. Take another breath, hold for 10 seconds, breathe out into the chamber, and then remove. Some people prefer to do 10 seconds in, hold, breathe out into the chamber, 10 seconds in, hold, breathe out into the chamber. Again, that's kind of my personal preference. And this is what we can use for adults in our clinics. And, and again, kids over eight or so should probably be able to use this. And they might think it's kind of neat because when they get through with it, it could be an airplane or something <laughs> of that nature. But again, once this is used, it goes home with the patient. Now, this actually can be reused, although, you know, a lot of people 
consider these to be a single-use item. It, it can be reused. Now, these are actually some of the uh, chambers that can be disassembled or have have uh, instructions about washing them. So again, it's it's the personal preference for chambers out in the uh, private medical world. This is what you know what I use uh, in in my particular clinics and what I'm comfortable with, what my nurses are comfortable with. Valerie, any other questions? Uh, well, there's a, a few questions okay. um, going on. First of all, um, somebody did ask if you had any examples from your pediatric practice and how you handled those and what you learned from from treating those particular patients. Okay. Well, actually, uh, as I mentioned, I've got a million stories. Of, you know, one of my one of my stories is the one I mentioned last year from a patient who actually came in from the WIC clinic. And I think what, what I learned from that, and I, I know what my nurses learned from that, is it just reaffirmed that we have to be prepared, that we have to be prepared to handle an emergency in the public health department, and that we also have to have our emergency protocol set up and practice our emergency protocol and know who's going to go get what in the emergency protocol. And I'm telling you, th this situation worked like a charm. I mean, the, because generally our clerical people are very involved and they're, you know, they're, they're getting information. They're either, uh, they're going to get in the cart, they're calling, uh, call 911, or they're uh, calling the patient's physician, or uh, they're calling the emergency room and telling the patient's coming over. So I think the things I, I learned is that it reaffirmed to me the need to be prepared. It reaffirmed to me the need to have a protocol, and it reaffirmed to me the need to practice your protocol. Uh, so I think that's what I learned from that. What I, I've learned from adults, and again, uh, you know, as I say to my nurses, we have this happen a couple of times a year. I mean, you know, in my public health area, we'll have something happen a couple of times a year. Uh, what I've learned from the adult situation is that even though people know they have a bronchospastic condition, even though they know they have a health problem, you know, they may forget their medicine, okay? They may not bring it with them. Or they may think, well, you know, I haven't had a problem in six months, so I don't need it anymore, so I just throw it away. Or occasionally with the, the HFA type meter dust inhalers that we have now, they don't feel full, okay? It seems, it's like some patients think if they take one or two puffs out of it, oh, I shake it, it doesn't feel full, so I need to throw it away. Well, again, if you'll notice on, these, on many of these inhalers, they have a... Uh, a little uh, number on the back. So some of them you'll be able to tell how many puffs or actuations are still in there. But I stress to the patient that just because it doesn't feel like something's in that canister, there's still something in that canister. Uh, and, you know, you need to not throw it away. If in doubt, if you are not sure that you've still got anything in there, take it to your pharmacist and ask uh, uh, one of them, ask him or her about whether or not that, that canister is still good. So I think that, that's what I've learned from adults, and that is that they may not have the medication with them, uh, or they may not think they need it anymore, or, well, they didn't think there was anything in there, so they just threw it away. So I, I think those are the things that, that I've learned. And again, all of this just reaffirms to me uh, that we have to be prepared, and, and we have to be trained, and that it also is very gratifying to me to work uh, with a staff of nurses uh, that are eager and anxious to continue to keep their skills uh, at the level that they can comfortably respond for our patients. Thank you, Dr. Landers. We feel the same about you. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, if you don't mind, we, I'm sure that the people um, that are watching this are interested in what's going on with the TB investigation up in um, Perry County. Okay, well, Over thank in. you. Well, in the last few minutes that we have, if everyone has uh, had all the all the bronchospasm discussion they can take out of me today, uh, Valerie has launched me into the subject that I can talk three minutes, three hours, or three days. And uh, the other night, Dr. White said it's not good to get the two of us together on tuberculosis because you'll never get out of here. Uh, tuberculosis has kind of been my my passion in in life. Uh, starting from the time I was a junior medical student, I became very interested in TB and TB control. And so even in my work as a pediatrician and also with the Alabama Department of Public Health, I've been able to uh, kind of uh, combine those together, if you will, to work TB control as well as pediatrics and, of course, specific interest in children that have either LTBI or uh, TB disease. But just briefly, talking about Perry County, 
Uh, we've had a lot of press on Perry County, and I think the first thing that I want to remind everyone about in talking about Perry County is this is not something that just happened one day and we decided to do this plan the next day. You know, we have uh, been trying various investigative measures uh, in Perry County for the last couple of years and working with different populations of patients and trying uh, different interventions. Again, we have uh, interview techniques and, and well-trained interviewers in the Alabama Department of Public Health. Anytime you have a tuberculosis case, you want to elicit what the close contacts are. I mean, we know that we're not going to get TB from standing outside with someone or being in a large room with a lot of ventilation, but rather, who are your close contacts? Who are the people that you live in the house with? Who are the people you ride around in the car with? I mean, these are the patients we need to get in for evaluation and preventive treatment. So, uh, regrettably, we weren't able to get that information, uh, with, even with multiple uh, interviewers of, of different backgrounds. So, you know, we tried non-monetary incentives uh, to get people to come in to be tested, and uh, that didn't seem to be yielding. Uh, so we did a health fair and did not seem to get the turnout that we needed. So we continued to try various other measures that we do in, in public health. I won't, I won't go into because it would take me a while. Uh, and none of these seemed to work. And so uh, really in the fall of this past year, uh, we decided that we, we had to do something else. We had to try a different plan. And these kinds of plans are not executed overnight. I mean, you have to work with your various partners uh, in, in the community and in public health to plan this kind of event. Uh, and of course, we decided that uh, our best uh, chance of, of getting a good yield was to offer a monetary incentive because some of these patients don't have transportation or they may you know, need to get lunch or something like that while they're uh, up in the, in the area of where we are. Or they, or they may just need some additional funds. I mean, this is a, this is a county that's uh, very underserved and, and has a, a po high poverty level. So, you know, we felt like this could yield uh, good results, and it actually did. And uh, as a result of this, we've screened 2,023 people as of yesterday with either uh, the interferon gamma release assay blood test, which we prefer if we can, two years of age and older, it does require drawing blood, or uh, the uh, PPD. And again, the PPD is still a good test. The skin test is still a good test. We just prefer the IGRA because it's a, a one-time test. You don't have to have someone come back and get a rating like you do with PPD. So again, we felt like that that was our most appropriate uh, uh, way to do this, and we've been able to screen over 2,000 people. At this point in time, we have 151 LTBIs, which is latent tuberculosis infection. Uh, all of you know that latent tuberculosis infection means that the person has the germ in their body, but they are not contagious to other people. But this is the opportunity we have to prevent. Basically, that germ is dormant. That germ is asleep in their body, and we can give preventive medicine and kill that germ. So that's very, very, very important uh, to, to find people when they are LTBI. Because we know that when people are infected with a TB germ, depending on the age group, it's about a 10% lifetime risk of progressing from LTBI to tuberculosis. However, that being said, children under five years of age and the zero to four age group have a higher risk, about 25% of progressing onto TB. And really, if they're infected under a year of age, it may even be 40%. So that's why we want to get really young kids that have been infected and give preventive therapy. So that's something we need to consider. Also, we know that persons, uh, as uh, kids are in the adolescent age group, if they were infected as a young child and did not get prevention, they might have a slight increase there of risk of developing TB. And then older persons or persons that are on anti-inflammatory agents such as the 10F-alpha uh, antagonists. I mean, these are all agents that, you know, you see those advertised on TB and you mentioned that people should be screened for TB. Mm -hmm. So again, we're looking at right now 151 people that we found out of 2023 that have an opportunity for prevention. And of course, as part of that preventive effort, and screening effort, you know, we've had to do chest x-rays on these patients and I'm very thankful for Dr. Albert White uh, who has just been tremendous to our effort in reading all the chest x-rays so far. I think he's up to 85 and uh, that's a lot of chest x-rays to ask someone to read but uh, we're getting more chest x-rays. We're having another clinic, Dr. White, we're getting chest x-rays one day, he's reading them that day 
or the next morning. I mean, he's that quick on it, so we really appreciate him. Have um, you found anybody that actually has TB disease we actually in the screening? Have. We actually have, and I think that's been, to me, the most significant part of the screening. You know, the citizens of Perry County, this has been stressful for them, uh, but they've also been very, very patient with us, and uh, it's been very gratifying to work with individual patients in Perry County. Um, we have found uh, one known case of tuberculosis at this point in time, and we are looking at some information on a couple of other patients. We don't have all of our diagnostic materials, but we, we do expect that we'll find two more patients, at least at this point in time, based upon the information that I think that phone call is about. Uh, the other thing that, that I want to mention about the screening is now that we've screened and now that we've found patients with LTBI and have found a few cases of TB, which we will treat, uh, I want to mention that, you know, we actually, out of the, uh, I believe, 26 cases that we originally started out working with, that, you know, we, we treated uh, nine of those patients, excuse me, we treated 15 of those patients already, and they, they're finished with medicine, and this is from the original outbreak. And we have several others, um, and I, I think it's eight or nine that are still on medicine. Uh, regrettably, we did have the three fatalities to, to occur because those patients were not identified early uh, in their in their illness, but uh, we don't want that to happen. So what we're looking at right now is again, you know, continuing medication on patients that are already on treatment, being successfully treated, and then treating our new uh, cases as they are identified. And just kind of in the final minutes that I have here, I know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the patients and the response in Perry County, and it's been very, very, very good to work down there. But I think we also need to recognize that these kinds of efforts cannot be done without the dedication of the staff of the Alabama Department of Public Health. And, you know, our staff has worked tirelessly and diligently. You know, people getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to drive to be in Perry County uh, to get there to start screening, you know, between 250 and 300. One day we drew 394 specimens. Okay, and that is a lot of work, as you know, being a nurse. And not just nurses, we have our disease intervention specialists who have been very involved from multiple programs, not just TB. We've had disease intervention specialists from our other programs, such as the immunization program, such as the STD program. We've had nurses from other public health areas in the state of Alabama. We've had nursing supervisors. We've had nurse practitioners. Uh, those nurses have all come out and supported us. But also the extreme importance, I mean, we as physicians and nurses, we focus on our procedures. We focus on drawing the blood. We focus on our patients. But none of that is going to get processed without a very, very skilled clerical person mm -hmm. who keeps us running and makes sure that we have labels and we have documentation of that paperwork and we have requisitions and we have that information all gathered together with those specimens so those specimens can be sent to the lab and processed correctly and we can get that information back. So I have to give a shout out to the nurses, I have to give a shout out to the DIS, I have to give a shout out to the clerical people that have supported us as well as the administrative people in, in the Alabama Department of Public Health in order to make this effort happen. Again, screening this many people is not a small task. And now we're in a second phase. I, I call it phase two because, you know, I do things phase one, phase two, phase three. Our second phase is to complete the chest x-rays on patients, uh, look at any additional laboratory data that might need to be done. In addition to that, we're going to start these patients, and we have started some patients on medication, but make sure those patients tolerate that medication and complete the medication. We're trying to use short course 3-HP, and if I had time, I'd talk about 3-HP a lot more, but it's a 12-week it's a regimen, and we can use that in two years of age and older, and we're trying to use 3-HP to the extent that we possibly can, both to get the patient finished with treatment because patients would like to have shorter treatment, and also to be able to uh, continue our other routine tuberculosis control activities in the state of Alabama. You know, Dr. Miller reminded us this morning uh, that uh, I believe it was last year we had 119 patients and the year before we had 138 patients with TB disease in the state of Alabama. And if you look at our statistics, about 40 counties out of our 67 counties had 
a person with tuberculosis. So this is what we do every day. You know, TB control is what we do every day. But we believe that it's extremely important for us to continue this focus and continue this education and to do all that we can to not only protect the health of the citizens of Perry County, but all the citizens of the state of Alabama. TB control, that's what we do. So. That's great. Thank you. We still have a little time, so if anybody has any more questions, we'd love for you to call or either email us. But while I've got you, um, okay. you know, one of my particular interests is influenza, and I have okay. read that there is a, a, a serious flu, a new flu, or uh, an outbreak of flu or something like that. I've been seeing little snippets on the news. Have you heard anything about that? Well, certainly we're seeing an increase in influenza activity here with just our, our regular influenza. And thankfully, it has waited till February. And those of us that are working TB control and Zika virus are really glad uh, because the, this is what we also do in communicable disease. Uh, what I'm seeing right now is, is just a, a little bit of literature on that. For the most part, our vaccine this year does seem to be effective in covering the four viruses that are, you know, the four viruses that are in there that seem to be the prevalent uh, influenza. And I, what I'm, I'm hoping is if we can continue mild weather, good hand washing, covering the cough and staying at home when you're sick, that we might avoid an influenza outbreak uh, of the proportion that we've had in the past. Certainly influenza is a, is a very smart virus. And as a result of that, I'm sure that, you know, if there can be an additional virus that's not in that vaccine that influenza can get out there and infect us with, it probably will. Of course, what we do is we base our influenza virus vaccine for the next year on what we've seen the previous year. And I think we've got good coverage this year, but I do think that it's, it's year to year. I mean, last year was not a good match, and we wound up having less than 20% uh, effectiveness. But again, 20% is better than 0%. And it's so. not too late for a flu vaccine. Absolutely. You know, I tell people it is not too late as long as we have influenza vaccine available and pharmacies have it, your doctor's office has it. Uh, I believe the health department still has some, although we, we gave a good bit of ours. Uh, but it is not too late to get an influenza vaccine. During the influenza season, get your influenza vaccine as early as possible. But if for some reason you haven't gotten it yet, it's not too late to either see your health care provider or uh, come to the health department or go to your pharmacy and get influenza vaccine. I uh, do have another question okay. as uh, we're still on the air here. Um, if you have like allergy induced asthma, mm -hmm. would it, is and that's your trigger, would it ever be that the other triggers aren't your triggers like like um, exercise and stuff like that? Can, do we, do you ever like convert over to like a, you just got this kind of asthma trigger, but then all of a sudden you have a different asthma trigger? Well, you know, what I see in children, Valerie, uh, is that uh, asthma triggers don't like to travel alone, okay? <laughs> they like to have something else to go with them. So uh, while uh, many of us are, are familiar with allergy testing uh, uh, that might indicate that you're highly allergic to a certain pet and that you're slightly allergic to a, a certain tree or a certain mm. mold, uh, allergens uh, and uh, triggers, again, they don't like to travel alone. So you... With patients that I see, especially children, I will see multiple triggers. It may be that some people, when they're around a cat, you know, that really triggers them, and they may only have a, a little bit of difficulty when there's a shift in the uh, weather or something that is non, that is, you know, non-allergen related, more the cold air or something of that nature. So, you know, I remind people that it's it's generally not a single trigger and that uh, when I have a person who has a history of asthma, you know, they may only be triggered, it appears, by that, uh, that cat or dog, but I make them aware that certainly, you know, chemicals or changes in the weather. Or again, if I have a child that has a lot of allergy and they uh, have asthma as a result of those allergies, that exercise, we want them to exercise. We want them to engage in exercise. In fact, exercise is very good but we want them to take uh, preventive measures based upon what their physician has advised them in order to uh, reduce their risk of having asthma with that exercise. That's great to know. And Thank I'll tell you, you, this Alabama change in the weather has about killed me. And I don't have asthma, so I can mm -hmm. only imagine if I had asthma how I'd be reacting to right. living in this state because it's 
cold one day and hot the next. Right. Well, it's been a rough year for that. Yes, so. it has. Well, um, there are no more questions and no phone calls, so uh, we are so happy that you watch this program with us. It's also going to be available on demand, so uh, please tell your coworkers that they're welcome to watch it. And uh, we thank you for presenting for us. And, you know, we had um, wondered if so, with so flu few slides if you could cover an hour and a half. And we said, yes, Dr. Landers can do it with that few slides. So we appreciate you very, very much. Well, thank you. And I apologize about the cell phone. I <laughs> thought it was on silent. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me today, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you.